Welcome to the Real Python Podcast. This is episode 109. Did you know you can add testing to your Python code while simultaneously documenting it? Using docstrings, you can create examples of how your functions should interact in a Python REPL and test them with the built-in doc test module. This week on the show, Christopher Trudeau is here, bringing another batch of PyCoders Weekly articles and projects. Christopher shares an article by previous guest Mike Driscoll about testing with doc test. This is a great way to get started with testing your own code, and it offers the added benefit of documenting functionality. We talk about a recent RealPython article titled Pagination for a User-Friendly Django App. Spreading your content across multiple pages can significantly improve the user experience of your web application. This article takes you through configuring Django's built-in pagination tool and how to combine it with other web tools. We discuss a recent article about Python type hints and the author's disappointment with them. We also include reactions from a couple of online communities to the article. We cover several other articles and projects from the Python community, including why it's important to close files in Python, how Dunder methods are awesome, a bidirectional Python dictionary, prettier Git diffs, and a command line game to learn Git. MailTrap is an online tool for email testing in dev and staging environments. Assess the deliverability of an email without sending it to real people. No dummy email accounts needed. All right, let's get started. The Real Python Podcast is a weekly conversation about using Python in the real world. My name is Christopher Bailey, your host. Each week, we feature interviews with experts in the community and discussions about the topics, articles, and courses found at realpython.com. After the podcast, join us and learn real-world Python skills with a community of experts at realpython.com. Hey, Christopher, welcome back. Hey there. How you doing? Good, good. So I hear you're just back from PyCon US. How did you enjoy it? It was really awesome meeting the RealPython team in person. <laughs> I know a lot of people say that, but it was, you know, th these are people I've been working with almost just over three years for some of them. And then a few are a little newer, but that was really fun. And then to have people come up to me at the booth and say they heard the show and our fans was really cool. Somebody actually really wanted to get a picture with me, which is awesome. Oh, you're internet famous. That's, I guess, that's yeah. the second best kind. <laughs> I, I think so, yeah. And uh, probably the funniest thing was that I, I sounded different because I wasn't at one and a half times speed. <laughs> 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 so I, I know that people probably listened to the show uh, sped up a little bit. I said, well, I do speak fairly fast. They said, yeah, yeah, everybody else I listened to at 2x. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so I have that going for me. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I know all about that. I, I review my courses myself in like at 1.6. Oh, wow. And so when I go back into the editor and I'm like, wow, I'm slow. And, and most people would not accuse me of being a slow talker. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, I think we're both in that camp. <laughs> yeah, so that was really neat. And then, uh, as I mentioned briefly on the last episode in my intro, I met a real large group of people that... I'm going to have as guests. I'm, I'm just really, I'm actually sending out the invitations today to like try to start lining them all up. And they're all kind of across the whole spectrum of Python from data science to, oh gosh, environmental science kind of stuff to other teachers, people that work on VS Code, all these different organizations. And uh, it's fun. I'm excited because sometimes, you know, sometimes there were times where I couldn't get enough guests on the show and be like reaching out to try to find some people to want to be on. And now I have like a, a nice big backlog, which I'm excited to to share with everybody coming up soon and lots of talks to to talk about coming up. I hope they get on YouTube soon. Did you, did you have a favorite? Uh, I got to see the beginning of Wukas's keynote, uh, Wukas Longa, the developer in residence. And he was talking about types, which we were going to have as part of our discussion today. Yes, and I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> yeah, I didn't get to see all of it. I got to see the beginning of it. And so we were taking shifts at the booth, kind of going back and forth. So I, I was in and out of a handful of them. They didn't quite align time-wise uh, on the hour, which is not uncommon, I guess, for a conference. But I really enjoyed what he was talking about. And he's very, very passionate about 
type checking and kind of helping to shepherd forward a lot of these peps that have, gosh, we've been talking about off and on for a while now. So that was really interesting. Uh, I got to see, again, about half of <laughs> the introduction of PyScript, which was with Peter Wang, who's from Anaconda. And he's agreed to come on the show, so I'm going to get that scheduled soon. Uh, a lot of people are very excited about that. And I'm hoping maybe I can get Russell Keith McGee back on, who worked on Beware. I, I believe he's still working on that project, but he is now actually working on PyScript also, which is kind of building on our conversation last week. It, it's on top of Pyodide. So there was a lot of Python inside of web browser kind of talk and interesting stuff there. There's been a lot of buzz about it, like uh, several of the newsletters I follow. It's all over the news groups. So there's a lot of excitement about it. Yeah. And, you know, it's really early days, so that it, it is going to need a lot of work on it. But it, kind of the most excited I've seen people be in, in quite a while in the Python space ab about this stuff. And getting a group like Anaconda behind it is great because they have all these kind of connections with trying to get the libraries that data science world all uses and financial world and so forth use uh, behind the scenes to get that working in it too, I think is great. So yeah, a lot of the keynotes. Uh, and then uh, there was a Sean and Kelly, uh, Sean Tibor and Kelly Shuta Paredes, who's, they do the Teaching Python podcast. We got to hang out a little bit, which was really fun, but they hosted the Education Summit, which unfortunately I don't think is videoed and going to be online, but there was a lot of really neat talks in that and I enjoyed that quite a bit. They talked about a, a subject where the assumption that a lot of people have to get kids interested in programming is, oh, everybody loves games. And it's like, well, actually, no, <laughs> not everybody does. Right. And so like using that as your foundation for teaching is maybe kind of a, a misstep, hmm. which brings up a previous conversation I had with Al Swigart, which somebody else I got to see and hang out with. So that was really fun. And um, he's got an upcoming book about recursion that we're probably going to have him talk on the show. So yeah, it was really cool. Talked to Pablo again, uh, Pablo Galindo Sagado about uh, Memray. He'd like to come on and talk about that memory profiler. Also something that's getting a lot of buzz. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was just, it was really cool. You know, I don't get really starstruck, but I was just excited to, to, you know, put, names to well you know when you're already internet famous yourself you're just rubbing oh. <laughs> elbows with the other internet famous people that's the way it's supposed to work yeah yeah i lost my voice though trying to trying to speak through my mask <laughs> to everybody <laughs> so but yeah it was very cool i enjoyed it uh, quite a bit we don't really have so much news per se but we do have a uh, several topics and a discussion this week and of course our projects i was wondering you want to start first Sure. I'm going to start out with uh, one of the real Python articles. Uh, this one's by Ian Curry, and it's called Why Is It Important to Close Files in Python? It's actually more of a computer science article with Python examples than a capital P Python article. And that's okay. not that that's a bad thing. It's just it's talking about things like file handles and resource usage. And this is universal to pretty much all coding languages. So, you know, even if you're not a Python person, there's some value here. Yeah, most of the examples of opening a file to read or write in Python usually use a context manager, and that's kind of best practice. So you, that's usually what you see. Uh, if you're not familiar with that term, a context manager is a block of code that starts with that with statement. Everything indented under the with statement is in a context and behind the scenes, you can run pre and post conditions. So when you use the open function with that with block, what happens is there's a post condition that closes the file for you. So that's a thing of beauty. That means you don't have to remember to close the file yourself. You don't have to manage it yourself. So without a context manager, you've got to actually call close on a file handle manually. And this can get more complicated than it sounds because the wrong exception might mean that you would skip over the place where you called close and it would sit there open. File management is one of those places where you tend to get a few more exceptions because you're hitting the operating system and, you know, something might be wrong with the file. So you're more likely to get an exception. So best practice before the with block was to use uh, a try accept block with a finally statement and then have the close inside of the finally. But if you're coding in Python, the answer is use a with statement. There's really no excuse. It's It's been around since PEP 343, which was 2005 and Python 2.5. Okay. <laughs> so we don't even have a two versus three thing here. Just do it that way. Yeah. 
that's a lot of talking, and I still haven't actually addressed the article's question, which is why. File handles are controlled by the operating system, and like memory or use of the CPU or what processes you can see, the, these are all things the operating system is responsible for. I'm going to keep using the phrase file handle because I grew up in the Unix world. If you're on the Windows side, you may see it called a file descriptor. It's more or less the same thing. Okay. So file handle is actually under, underneath. It's just a number. Uh, and the operating system uses it to map to a particular file that you're interacting with. So you can see the actual number in Python by calling file no, that's no as in short for number, as a method on your actual file handle. So uh, I'm actually in the process of writing a course for Python's MMAP module, and it actually uses these file numbers instead of the file handles. So there are lower level operating system kind of calls where you'll see this kind of stuff. The handles themselves are limited by the operating system. This is usually done for safety purposes. If a single process is opening an enormous number of files, something's probably gone wrong. So the operating system usually restricts this. Varies from operating system to operating system as to what the restriction is, but the number's typically somewhere in the thousands. Each file you have open at a time is also in a risky sort of state. If your code crashes, it's possible that the file will get corrupted. And both your OS and Python try their best to stop that, but sometimes stuff just happens. So when I was in school, I worked part-time in the engineering department support center, and people would come in for, you know, account resets and general issues and that kind of stuff. Yeah. And one day a PhD student came in to me with a corrupted Word file. It was his only copy of his thesis. Um, and I wasn't able to recover the whole thing, but I was able to pull the text out of it, and he was very, very grateful. Okay, just have to reformat it now. <laughs> yeah, he, he kept smiling at me even while I was lecturing him about backups. He was just, yes, yes, thank you. You, you can talk to me however you want. Now now I'll go, go put my diagrams back in my document. Uh, anyways, where was I? So file handle limits. If your process tries to open too many files, Python will raise an OS error exception. And the article shows you a little code snippet in a REPL opening 10,000 files for writing in a tight loop that does that. So you can see it actually happen and play with it. And one of the things to keep in mind is in many operating systems, everything is a file. File handles are used to abstract socket connections, shared memory, inter-process communication, and other stuff. So although thousands of file handles sounds like a lot, if you're writing a web server, you might actually run into these kinds of limits and have to deal with them. Article's got a nice little collapsed aside that talks about LSOF on Unix and a similar tool on Windows called Process Hacker. Both of these tools allow you to see information about the file handles in the system. I've used LSOF a lot, particularly to get information about open sockets in a system. So again, because Unix treats everything as a file, listing the file handles shows you a lot of information. And then finally, the article shows you how to actually crash your program so you can see the results of an open file. File writes actually happen in chunks. So one possibility is that you thought you wrote something hasn't actually been written yet. The write buffer gets flushed automatically when you close a file. So if you haven't closed it and you haven't called flush, you might miss some data, for example. There are other consequences as well. In Windows, only one process can own a lock on a file at a time. Mm. So crashed programs can sometimes leave the file locked, making it impossible for another program to open it. There are also potential security risks. If I've dropped a file handle because the program's crashed and another file goes and tries to grab that and is able to pick it up, it can inherit the security privileges on that file, uh, which allows you to act as somebody else, and that can get uh, messy. Mm. So there's not a lot of Python in the article, but there's plenty to learn. And you know, beyond the simple use a context manager, there's some good depth on how your code interacts with your OS and your file system. And so if it's not something you uh, know a lot about, it's a good place to start. Yeah, it's interesting where you have to intersect with <laughs> computer science from time to time and kind of understand what's happening. And, you know, I, I agree with the use of the context manager. There's a good article that's linked and kind of behind it that talks a little bit about more how the with statement has its own sort of going in and going out of the with statement and how that kind of helps with all of that. If I remember correctly, it's Dunder Enter and Dunder Exit, actually. So yeah. uh, it's, it's back to that Dunder stuff, which is a nice little segue for you. Ah, yeah, definitely. And I wanted to mention that uh, the person who was kind of helping Ian with this particular article, reviewing it, was uh, Jim Anderson. And Jim's been on the show before, but that was somebody else I got to hang out with for the first time. Well, actually, for the second time, we met at Pi Colorado in 2019. But Jim was 
I jokingly, he, he was out there wrangling people and bringing them over. And hey, this is a person who should talk to you on the podcast. So he brought over like two or three different people. So that, I, I appreciate it, Jim. Thanks. Yeah, he's somebody I've only ever talked to on text. We've uh, we, we've swapped contributions to uh, coding tools for each other. So we've interacted as uh, coders, but uh, not as human beings. He's he's a tiny little icon in Slack, and that's it. <laughs> yeah, totally. So here we go into the Dunder world. <laughs> This one is by John Lockwood. It's on his site, which is called Code Solid. The title is Dunder Methods in Python, and then the colon, the ugliest awesome sauce. And why he thinks Dunder methods, and again, if you're not familiar with them, you probably have experienced them in one time or another working inside of Python, especially if you've done anything that's object-oriented. You may have seen the double underscore and then init double underscore, or we talked about it quite a bit a week ago, talking about, or a couple weeks ago, talking about class constructors, which is, and it is part of, and then also Dunder new. And so it's just standing for two underscores. So double underscore, whatever the particular method is, and then another double pair of underscores. They have lots of different names. I had a kind of a deep conversation with Brett Ken our first time together, where I wanted to know a little bit more about it. He was going through this whole unraveling Python, which kind of has led in a lot of ways to some of this stuff where we've been talking about WebAssembly and the idea, like, what's the smallest, like, viable version of Python? And and it's all kind of related, which is kind of cool. I said, people call them Dunder. I've had people often, when I was really just starting, they would throw out this term, oh, yeah, you can use magic methods, which I thought was kind of interesting term because they aren't per se magical, but they are allowing you to do things that are maybe kind of hidden in in the sense like you can modify objects and what what they can do. And I'll get to more of that as we go through. So this is kind of like a survey of, you know, what Dunder methods are. And last thing I wanted to mention is that I guess the official name in, in the world of Python, the actual core developers, is their special methods. You don't hear that term very often. And he He actually is trying to use it more often, Brett said he was. So the first one is, you know, again, if you've written a class, we spoke at them in length about class constructors. I don't want to go too deep into that, but they are allowing you to initialize your class or potentially are allowing you to kind of do really interesting things with new, um, where you can kind of do a bit of like some factory stuff and kind of make unique versions of the class in some ways in how it's constructed. And then the one that I ran into first in some of the courses I was trying to translate and turn into video courses was the one that is pronounced repr, but it's double underscore R-E-P-R double underscore. And this is the representation of if you make an object of a class and you were just to type the name of it, and you've probably seen before in the uh, angle brackets, it'll say, they'll have like this kind of interesting name for the thing that's kind of ugly. But you can make a representative version of this. And by, in your definition of your class, you define repr and then have a string representation of what it would look like to create a version of this thing. And that's kind of the best practice for it. So the it should create code that could be used to reconstruct the actual object. And there's another way that you can show objects as you're exploring your code and maybe playing with it in the shell. And that's to have a Dunder STR string, which is a more human readable form. And so you can kind of like show what this object that you've created from the class is. And then it gets into the whole area of overloading other methods that you can do. And that's where the sort of magic, I think, is where people refer to. If you're maybe thinking about a particular object that you're creating and length doesn't make sense the way that it could be calculated you can make your own version of a length method and so it would be dunder len and then it actually goes even further and this is where it got really interesting to me that if you want to change the behavior of objects and how they would be compared to each other say like if you were to compare them with a double equal sign like this is supposed to be equal to this, or this is supposed to be greater or less than and so forth. There's a whole set of them where you can override the default, maybe mathematical tr- attempt to compare them. And maybe there's other things that 
would it make more sense for equality for you. And so you could, that particular method is double underscore EQ. So it's, it's a good survey of, of a lot of these things. It's not a super long article, but they can kind of give you an idea of where you can kind of go with this. And then I think the last one that he kind of talks about is uh, if you're creating objects that can be an iterable, you can uh, decide how through dunder iter, uh, how to begin an iteration. And then you can also have a dunder and next. And it's a very interesting example, kind of hard to explain over a podcast, but I think it's a good way to kind of get in and learn a little bit about what's going on with them. If you haven't explored them, it's a nice survey of some of them. And then, you know, the question comes up like, well, should I be doing this? Should I be overriding things and, and so forth? And, you know, it depends. Like this is kind of getting into the more advanced object oriented stuff that if you're wanting to have special functionality, hence the idea of special methods. I think the last one he gets into is talking about the double underscore doc, which is a way to represent the doc string. If you've ever, I encourage people to play in Python very often as a way to kind of educate themselves and, and get familiar with it. And I've used these alternative REPLs like BPython or IPython, where you can kind of get nice code completion and you can get highlight code highlighting and syntax stuff, and which really helps when you're doing a video course to kind of, you know, kind of showcase what these different objects are that you're talking about and what the syntax kind of means. But a good habit is to, if you're ex especially exploring other people's code, is to maybe type dir, which will bring up with, you know, a pair of parentheses and then whatever the particular object you're looking at. And it will then print out a directory of all the different methods the thing can do. And you will actually see all the dunder methods that are this object potentially has. And so that's a good way to kind of see that. And then uh, the dunder doc is an, another one that can, again, be used for ex exploring what's going on. So yeah, I, I think it's a good way to kind of get into this stuff. Do you override things often? Well, it's interesting because one of those... Um... So I was coding in the 80s and 90s when operator overloading was first becoming a thing. And it can really be abused. You can get to a place mm -hmm. where you're looking at it and you're like, why is plus doing that? Yeah, yeah. And so like everything, it's it's useful to have. But if your coders do something stupid with it, um, stupidity ensues. <laughs> so like, you know, one, one of my... Another meaning for special. <laughs> exactly, right? And one of my favorite examples of it where it makes sense is the Pathlib library. So they've overridden division because paths in Python are forward slash. And so you can yeah. join these things together using forward slash, and it makes the objects look like a path. And that makes perfect sense. And my brain doesn't look at it and go, why are they using division? But, you know, the flip side of it is you, if you start using bit shifting to mean something besides bit shifting, it isn't always obvious what the coder's trying to do with it. So I think it's, I think it's a useful tool, but it's always one of those things you got to be careful with. Yeah. Dunder string is at the core of how things appear inside of the Django admin. So uh, constantly yeah, defining that one without a doubt. Okay. And, you know, again, at risk of trying to sound like I'm segueing into the next topic, uh, the Dunder, <laughs> uh, the Dunder doc string, it kind of reminds us that everything in Python is an object, including the doc string that's associated with it. And if you want to start using tools like doc test, guess how they work? They look at Dunder string and they look at the string that's associated associated with it and then they start operating on it right i think it's one of the powers of the language it also if you're coming from other programming languages where we're very a, a lot of other languages are very protective of these kinds of things and in fact we'll have keywords like you know private or protected right right and and it takes a little bit of a shift to to sort of go well we everyone can use this and it's like yeah sure everyone can use this you should be careful though but everyone can use this right yeah yeah and document what you're doing yes yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah that's that's funny that totally leads into <laughs> we're, we're we're like the segue kings today <laughs> i i yeah it's um it, it not planned but that worked well so With MailTrap, you can see what your email looks like for the recipients without sending them. Set up MailTrap in less than five minutes to test your emails and share the results with team members. Get the list of errors with a reference to the line of code that requires fixes with HTML and CSS validation. 
See all crucial email reports right in your inbox. Get started for free at MailTrap.io. And also try out our new transactional email sending solution. Go to MailTrap.io to complete the email development cycle. Test and send your emails within one solution. So speaking of our segue, so uh, I've got two shorter ones that I want to talk about. A couple useful libraries and articles on, on, on a couple useful libraries that I can cover sort of quickly. The first one is called Python Testing with DocTest, and it's by Mike Driscoll. It introduces you to DocTest, which is an interesting little tool inside of the Python unit testing world. So Python allows you to write tests inside of doc strings in your code. And the tests look just like REPL sessions. In fact, you can just copy and paste a REPL session into the doc string. When you run doc test, it searches your code for these kinds of test strings and then executes them. So what it does is it tries to run the same thing that you put after the bracket, angle bracket, angle bracket, angle bracket, like you would type into the REPL. And then it checks whether or not the result in your string matches the result it got. And if it did, your test passes. And if it didn't, it fails. So the strongest argument for this kind of test is that it's co-located with your code. Yeah. So if you change your code, the test is sitting right there on top of it to remind you that you need to change the test. And it, of course, also acts as documentation. So other programmers are looking at it and they can see an example of how you're calling this function, for example, and go, oh, okay, I see how you use it. You put these things in, you expect that thing out. The only downside of this tech, and he doesn't get into this in the article, but I've bumped into it myself, is certain kinds of tests are tricky, if not impossible. So, for example, if you're dealing with dates, the result in the REPL will be different each time you run it, and so it will fail. So you tend to have to move to other kinds of testing tech if you're going to go down that path. But for functions that are determinative, every time you call it, you get the same result. This works nicely. Yeah, I was going to mention that I, I think I'll feature it this week as the video course of the week, but there's a, a really good example of this in process um, in this Python coding interviews, tips and best practices. I found it a really great kind of example, like going through these, you know, common types of questions you might get in some of the simpler interview questions and having doc tests is a, a great way to document that. And everybody's kind of on the same board. And then you need to make sure they pass <laughs> to you know make sure that you've created the the correct solution and and so forth for the interview. Yeah, and and you can actually you can use external files as well. So you do, it doesn't have to be part of the doc string. So you can actually have a text file that essentially contains docs doc test style tests. So you can use it as a testing suite if you like that way. Uh, as a little bit of a behind the scenes thing, if you've seen some of my courses. I've got this little player that shows things. It looks like it's in the REPL. It's not actually in the REPL. And I've also got a quality test on top of it that I call Torquemada. And it runs black and uh, doc test and two or three other things on these kinds of files. So it spits out if I've you know made a mistake inside of this player. And it's essentially just using doc test to do the testing to make sure that I haven't mucked something up before I present it. So <laughs> Nice. Behind the scenes. Exactly. There you go. Don't pay any attention to the man behind the curtain exactly so second article is about a third party library called by dict and is by christopher Tao. and that's all we need a third christopher in this conversation yeah uh, all right i hadn't come across by dict before uh, and although it's a bit of a niche case it's really helpful in those niche cases uh, so by dict is short for bi-directional dictionary and like a regular old dictionary a by dict has keys and values the difference here is that the values can also be used as keys so hmm. consider a list of country codes where you map, say, U.S. to United States and CA to Canada, etc. There are cases in your code where you might want to go backwards to go from CA to Canada as well as from Canada to CA. So without the by dict, typically what you do with this is you start with one dictionary and then you loop through it and create a second dictionary that goes in the other direction for reverse mapping. And, and I, I've had to do that a fair number of times with um, like drop down lists and things like that in uh, Django. Hmm. This is similar to a real world situation is you can buy something in some places called a reverse phone book. And that's one where you look up the phone number and it gives you the name of the person. Yeah. And so by deck uh, basically allows you to do this kind of stuff. And of course, it uses less code and less memory. So articles really detailed, but a lot of it really is just sort of this is how this is like dictionary. And here's where the other parts are. So for me, it was kind of a I got the key part out of it, which was, hey, this exists. <laughs> and then the rest of it was like, oh, okay, yeah, dictionaries, I got it. So, but yeah, a good little uh, summary of the tool. So I don't know if this 
is too deep of a concept to dive into here, but like if you keys have to be unique, you know, they literally are almost like a subset of a, of a set, you know, like individual unique keys in this particular case for it to be bi-directional. What if you have values that are the same? I would assume it would cause a problem. I had, haven't played with it. Okay. I would, I would also expect. So the other aspect of a dictionary is the keys have to be hashable, right? The values do not the, I would suspect it would have to go both ways there as well. Okay. Yeah. All right. Cool. Uh, the the common use cases usually are string to string maps. So, uh, you know, you're, you're probably good in that case. Okay. Speaking of Django, uh, <laughs> I, uh, this article is from Philip Axony and it's titled pagination for a user-friendly Django app. This particular project that he has you working with, he has kind of a nice build already going. You can download the code and work through it. The focus of it is truly about pagination. If you're not familiar with that, the idea is that you have, let's say, well, I guess maybe you got to go back in time and talk about where sort of Django came from. Django as a tool was initially designed for newspapers or magazines and these other kinds of that that kind of world where there's potentially going to be lots and lots of articles and lots and lots of content that's going to span across unless you want it to scroll forever it's going to be probably broken into separate pages inside of django there is a paginator built in that you can use and what i really liked about this again these are what i like with these some of these step by step kind of projects and in this case this tutorial is you get this sort of set up and then a lot of people probably haven't played with this a ton, but you can, instead of run server, after you type your Django commands to kind of set everything up, you could, instead of putting run server, you could put shell. And then there you have an interactive shell kind of playing with some of the things inside of your Django project. And this, in this case, was a nice way for him to kind of show ways that you can kind of quickly paginate different things. And there's a lot of ways that you can have this information displayed so there's everything from you know the current page show me buttons on the bottom with all the pages there's the term elided which is to omit or eliminate for consideration but that's when you're using an ellipsis kind of in between page numbers so you're like maybe so one two three and an ellipsis and then like 17 18 at the end or something like that and it that's included in the pagination tool there but you have to decide how you want to control that and how many things before and after. So it goes into a lot of detail there. And then there's other methods of just having like just previous and next or first and last, and then any kind of combination of these techniques. So the first, I don't know, two thirds of the article go really deep into all of these things and have you playing with it. And then eventually setting it up on the web, you end up creating a kind of a simple site that is exploring the Python keywords, which is kind of a, nice topic to kind of use in dividing them up into the separate pages. And then the very end of it shows some other techniques, which probably are more common than a lot of people might see across the web, which is to use forms of dynamic JavaScript, you know, libraries and so forth. And the first one uses like Ajax and some other tool techniques in there. In those cases, the code is collapsed kind of in the same way you were talking about before with the file article where you know, this is a lot of detailed information. If you want to dive in and, and copy this code out and kind of play with it, it's there. I, I know a lot of people maybe are not as interested in adding lots of JavaScript to their Django project, but this allows you to do something called faux pagination to add things like a load more button, like as you're scrolling and you want it to add even more. So, you know, the, the idea of pagination, actually, I guess I skipped over this. The very beginning of it is a discussion of what it is when to use it and when not to use it and some examples of projects there. And that's one problem with the web is that there's so much information that can be loaded in there. You don't want it, your browser to show nothing while it's in the background trying to gather all these resources, show them and hence why it makes sense to break it apart. So loading more is a common one. And then another technique is infinite scrolling where as somebody's scrolling along, it's kind of loading the background. And then the last one is search, which is interesting. And so all of those are using sort of dynamic JavaScript stuff. And then there's code for all those examples there. So it's a, it's a nice deep dive 
into this topic. If you, if you have a, a very large blog, it's something you might have had to think about or other projects that uh, even something like you know photographs or other things where you have lots and lots of information you want to show across there. And uh, it's, it's a nice deep dive. I, I really like what Philip did with this. Yeah, the, the concept goes far deeper, but Django's actually sitting it on top of really stuff that's baked into SQL. So like this, uh, a lot of these concepts predate even web because you just have a problem of there's too many, you know, if I'm, I'm, I'm querying 10,000 rows in a database, I'm expecting 10,000 rows back. You can't flood the, the network with that. Or in the days where RAM was expensive, you might not be able to load all 10,000 rows into the computer. So there was this concept of, uh, please only send me the next 15, and then I've got an offset, so send me the next 15 starting at number 16. And the the Django pagination tools essentially build on top of that. So you can get into this even if you're not uh, showing the results. The Django pagination mechanism just sort of ties nicely into the presentation aspect of it as well. Yeah. Uh, do you, Have you had to lay that out for different clients because i know you've done yeah i've I've used it occasionally okay but yeah i've I've used it occasionally i think is the short version (laughs) sure that's fine yeah we don't have to go into deep dive there this week i want to shine a spotlight on another real python video course it covers the python skills to practice to stand out from the competition it's titled python coding interviews tips and best practices the course is based on a real python article by james timmons and in the course, instructor James Weijo takes you through how to use enumerate to iterate over indices and values, how to debug problematic code with breakpoint, format strings effectively with f strings, sort lists with custom arguments, use generators instead of list comprehensions to conserve memory, define default values when looking up dictionary keys, count hashable objects with the collections.counter class, and use the standard library to get lists of permutations and combinations. And along the way, test your code using Doctest. I think it's a worthy investment of your time to learn the skills that will showcase your knowledge of the Python language. Like most of the video courses on Real Python, the course is broken into easily consumable sections, and you get code examples for the techniques shown. All courses have a transcript, including closed captions. Check out the video course. You can find a link in the show notes, or you can find it using the search tool on realpython.com. Uh, well, that brings us to discussion, and I've already kind of hinted at it. There was an article, yeah, uninformative.de. <laughs> yeah, great, uh, great header there. the The title of the article, um, which we'll include a link to, is Python's "quote unquote" type hints are a bit of a disappointment to me, and. There's a preface now that's been added. You are reading version 2.0 of this blog post. Readers shared this link on Hacker News and Lobsters. And that's kind of where we kind of tied it in as a discussion thing. The last part of it is, which unexpectedly blew up and sparked many heated discussions. I've incorporated some of this feedback into this revised version. The premise uh, that he's saying here is that he feels that type hints maybe are not worth the effort that go into them because of a handful of reasons that he feels very strongly about. And the community definitely <laughs> got heated behind a lot of it, which the is com- very interesting. The community also feels very strongly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> strongly typed. <laughs> I don't know. We've talked about type hints a lot. And so I don't want to get too far. I guess I want to maybe point out some of the things that that he's saying. The first one, and I can refute them as I go as far as what a lot of the community and my feelings on some of it, but the first comment or note is not enforced at runtime. And yeah, it's not. The idea behind the type system and this adding typing to Python, I think by everybody who I've met through interviews and talking and so forth is that it's gradual. Like it, it, it's a work in progress. It's being added to it. And Python as defined is a, dynamic language. And so enforcing it is something that you, as somebody who wants to have that kind of functionality, you're going to have to add something like MyPy. And as a lot of people stated in their comments, yeah, you set up CICD and you have that as part of a step and so forth. This is the part that I can never quite wrap my head around. Okay. Because 
they could have made it part of the compiler okay and said if you don't put a spec next to it it's treated as any so essentially i could get the optional thing Mm -hmm. without it being a separate tool I suspect, and I have no evidence of this, but I suspect this is partially a political thing that the tool went off and built it without getting the core developers on side so that they could go off and build it. And now we're half pregnant. And that's not to say there isn't value here. And a lot of people whose opinion I respect a lot are big fans of it. Yeah. But I do find that you're asking for trouble because of the half pregnant. Right. Well, and that's the other thing that I think is part of the conversation is that you, as a beginner, and I've talked about this a handful of times on the show, that this was an area of Python that went beyond the tutorials and the examples that I was seeing, that when I went to look at code that was in other projects that were potentially you know working with other tools, especially web stuff, I would see them. I would see type annotations. I would see these, you know, colon stir or, you know, re, you know, this arrow thing. And I'm like, is that Python? You know, all these kinds of interesting little things that were these annotations. And they don't affect how your Python runs, but using a, a type checker, it will then verify that, yes, okay, you, you've explained this well. And that gets to a problem, and you just mentioned it, the... The idea of a dynamic language, how do we deal with something that could be whatever type you want, you know, depending on user input or what have you. And so there's this any, like, definition. And that's hard, you know, because the any type is, it could be anything, you know. And that's a problem if you have to decide, <laughs> you know, what is going to be dynamic or not dynamic, you know, in, in that sense. And so I, I don't know, like, it's the same problem in JavaScript as what some other people were mentioning, you know, and they've created a separate offshoot of the language t- called TypeScript. And it, when it is done, it is compiled. And it is compiled down to JavaScript, which is dynamic again. And so, like, Is that the direction we're headed? You know, I I don't know. Like, I don't know if we need to have a separate language to do a lot of these things. Well, I, I, well, you know, and of course it's, it's a conversation on the internet. So, you know, (laughs) oh, look, it's on fire. What a surprise. (laughs) Uh, What I find interesting, I find with a lot of this kind of stuff is you end up in this situation where it's like my worst case scenario versus your worst case scenario or it's better or worse than your worst case scenario right yeah like a lot of the counter seems to be well i'm maintaining a million lines of code and only real men can do that and i use type hits so stop talking yeah. to me right like right right and, and i you very seldom see anybody say well i'm maintaining a million lines of code and it's very helpful but when i'm writing a 500 line script i don't bother like it always seems to be a you know it, it you know i identify as someone who uses types and I, my attitude generally, whether it's this or anything else with code, is try to stick to the style of the library you're writing in. Right. And although I don't use this a lot, I can tell you I do find it frustrated when I get a pull request and somebody stuck it in because now I have to maintain your opinion in my code, right? Hmm. Um, and I think that's where it gets um, cranky, right? Sure. Uh, although I, I did dig up a, the, one of the quotes in uh, on the Hacker News site that I found very, very amusing was, ah, but what if I'm a masochist and I want all the verbosity of a statically typed language with none of the benefits? And yeah. it kind of summed up in a snarky little line, I think, where my head is with it. Yeah, you know, and I that's where it kind of gets hard. Like, it, as I was talking to Luciano, and this kind of gets into this, one other area that he's mentioning, which is the messiness of duct type compatibility. And for him, the addition of protocols, which is a new thing, is adding some of that sort of duct type compatibility that you can kind of, you know, like is like this, you know, is, is one of the terms or uh, does, you know, does this kind of thing is part of the definition and i don't want to go too far into it but episode 88 goes really deep into discussing type hints and protocols and and his opinions because he was in the same boat of like i don't know why we have this and like i'm not sure how to use it and i agree with what you're saying also the idea that if i'm writing a small script or i'm trying to teach python and get somebody going on it then 
I don't know if it needs to have it in there. If I'm creating something using CircuitPython that is only interacting with this, you know, electronic device, do I need to add type hints to it too? No. Like, it's gradual, you know, this is something that can be added to it. And I'm at the same time, I can see things like fast API and how it's using typing to make it work really well with other tools. And I've had several interviews lately with other people that are with without a doubt. I'm glad it's in the language. I, I personally might have done a couple things differently, but you know, yeah, I, sure, I, sure. I pick a topic where I can't say that, right? That that's part of what I think as I mentioned Lucas's talk, he's been shepherding a lot of these peps through to make typing cleaner and better because his the feedback that he got, and this is the part I only got so far to seeing, is somebody online had, you know, yay, online, <laughs> had thrown in the face of like, look how ugly this is, you know, how ugly types look. And it was it was an example out of um, PyTest. And PyTest, unfortunately, or fortunately, has to work in all of these really wide example of, you know, kind of information that I can receive. And so the type hints were really long with lots of options and lots of kinds of things in there. And so he kind of went step by step and cleaned it up and said, well, they aren't using the new standards. They could use black or something like this to make it actually look like more understandable by laying it out in, in a well understood sort of formatted way. And so he kind of, you know, he just sort of tore apart the idea, like, maybe this is ugly because it's ugly code and maybe not thought out in that way. And that's, it's a trick. Yeah. And then the challenge I have is it's like that, that argument also works both ways, right? So like, I see a lot of the, you know, the, the, particularly in the, you know, this is really helpful if you're dealing with millions of lines of codes. Well, I, I've never maintained millions of lines of code of Python. I have done it in other languages. And I and in statically typed languages and in those statically typed languages, I've seen things like unions of structs of unions of structs of unions. And you end up with using a void pointer to reference it all because crappy code is crappy code. <laughs> right. And, and right, right, right. this is the statically typed equivalent of any. So, uh, you, yeah, I, I think one of the things I always struggle with here and I recognize I'm an outlier. I don't like IDEs. I use a simple text editor. Well, that defines simple, an old text editor with very few plugins turned on. I and when I when I hear people talking about, well, I get this 10x productivity boost out of uh, using an IDE. No, you don't. No, you don't. I, I'm not saying your productivity goes up, but I guarantee it's not 10x. The meat for me, the hardest part of coding is thinking about it and designing it correctly. And my best coding is often done walking around the block and clearing my head. So, you know, supercharging the tool that I use that helps me do, you know, predictive whatever, I don't find it makes that much difference for me. Right. But I do understand that that's, that that's not the norm. But of course, because I come from that space, I'm not using a tool where type hints help me do auto completion, so it doesn't benefit me. But for those it does, uh, more power to you. And like you said, some of the API places, I think there's some beautiful spots for it. I think Django could probably be a lot cleaner if that type hinting stuff was there to try and do some of the database matching. Like they've had to, they had to jump through hoops yeah. to build field pieces that kind of accomplish a lot of the same kind of thing, right? So. Yeah, I think the IDE thing is interesting. And I guess I, I've i come into programming, did it really early on when I was in college, and then came back to it. And when I was introduced, it seemed like this was, you know, I initially was using something like Sublime, and then I very quickly moved into like VS Code and some of these other tools because those are what other people around me were using. And I like auto-completion, but I agree that, I don't know, maybe three quarters of the time, it's like, this is not <laughs> this is not really helping me, you know, like or three quarters of the time is useful and a quarter of the time it's like, oh wait, no, this completed something completely wrong. And so it's one of these things where you still really need to know what you're doing. And so I agree, like pluses and minuses across the board on all of that. And I think that's one other little note that he mentions is that a lot of projects don't in Python don't have them currently. And so there's like this third party attempt through things like TypeShed to add them which is interesting because then it's kind of like who's behind all of that, you know, and, and deciding on some of those things, which I think is kind of intriguing. So are they better than nothing? I would argue, yeah. You know, I, I think that 
there there is a need for them. There's definitely certain places where they work, and we have both agreed on some of that stuff. And you know, I'm <laughs> as much as we get into these discussions, I am very much not a religious person on any of these things. I'm the same. Yeah, no, I, I, you know, buy me a beer and I'll tell you my opinion, but I'm, I'm, <laughs> right. I'm you know, I'm not going to storm the castle over it. Right. Uh, you know, we, we, we work in an industry where, um, a certain degree of OCD and anal retention and anal retention is required, right? Like yeah, yeah, yeah. if you're going to spend hours looking for a comma that should be there or shouldn't have been there and, <laughs> and, and that, that makes you happy, right? You're going to have a certain personality type. So, uh, it, it really shouldn't surprise you that, uh, that there are some strong opinions about this on how things work, right? Yeah. Uh, everybody's got their own background that they bring to it. And I think, Honestly, this is one of the reasons Python's been so well embraced is because it's got that breadth. And this is why you've got, you know, data science people and you've got folks who are doing telescopes and you've got, you know, folks who are making web pages and yeah. the occasional person who takes on the challenge of building mobile in Python. But, uh, right. but of course, in trying to appeal to that wide audience, of course, you're going to find parts of the language that, uh, um, you know, uh, different people feel differently about. Yeah. Next time on Real Python's podcast, we'll discuss the <laughs> walrus operator and uh, whether or not you should stab somebody over that particular concept. <laughs> yeah, hopefully not. Yeah, the last thing that he mentioned um, as an update to his articles that somebody from the Cinder Project, which is from Meta, is a uh, quote unquote like a static Python. It's doing type checking at byte code compilation. And as another potential guest, I did talk to somebody who's working on that project and uh, possibly we'll have him come on to talk about Cinder, which is another sort of, you know, compiled version of Python, which is interesting. And they, There's, they're using it across their products. They are using on Instagram and got a real good boost for the Python code that's running Instagram. So yeah, there's a deep dive article in it in when this podcast comes out, will have been last week's newsletter. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, so yeah, the, the, there's uh there's a good article from uh, the folks at meta talking about not just how it works, but how they do uh, inlining and what that does for performance uh, improvement and all the rest of it's quite deep. Yeah. Cool. I, I think that moves us into projects. Probably not quickly enough. Yeah. <laughs> well, these are uh, these are related, which is kind of fun too. Yep. So I found this small but kind of cool, useful utility called Dunk, and it's a prettifier for the output of Git diff. It's built on top of the Rich library and uses pigments for code highlighting. So if you've ever used a GUI-based file comparison tool where it shows like one file on the left, another on the right, and like green lines for addition, red lines for deletions, that kind of thing, it essentially does that in your terminal for a git diff. So I don't know about you, but I find the what's uh, called the patch syntax, uh, which is an old Unix tool that nobody even uses anymore, but that's where it all comes from, that git diff uses. It's kind of hard to read. Mm. And it, it's gotten a bit better since they colorized it. I find it's a little clearer that the color makes a big difference. But Dunk fixes that and gives you a nice clear side-by-side -side comparison in full color. So cool. quick start on GitHub even shows you how to use pipx, which we've talked about before, or a git alias to make it easier to use Dunk across all your projects. And this is, uh, so it's a project by Darren Burns, and he warns you up front that it's in alpha state, <laughs> uh, caveat emptor, <laughs> yeah. but it worked for the things that I played around with, and uh, I suspect I'm going to be adding it into my tool chest. Yeah. I, I like this one too. It's, it's also Git related <laughs> and it's called Git dash good. That's why I'm using that voice because the, is the about statement is want to get good, then get good and get good at Git. <laughs> anyway, so it's a, uh, it's a little silly, but it's kind of like a text adventure slash command line trainer for Git commands. I like that it goes beyond just, okay, how to do a commit, how to, you know, set up your thing, make sure that you've identified yourself and your email address in, in your settings and so forth. And it goes into a bit of a focus on branching and working with branches. And so I thought it was a, a kind of a fun way to explore using Git in a way that I think can kind of move you a little further along with this topic. I know there are a lot of 
tools that try to, again, like add a GUI or some other kinds of things like that, maybe. But the majority of people end up using command line tools for this and, and learning the commands and, and working through it. And so I, I found it as a fun project. It's by Ben Thayer. And yeah, check it out. Like, as I think it's a fun way to kind of get, get yourself a little further in using Git. And it's G-I-T dash G-U-D. Hence my, my <laughs> goofy pronunciation there. So I recently came across a new course from Michael Kennedy at Talk Python about uh, Git. So if you're into this space, it might provide some value. Uh, what he's doing a little different here is rather than it being your usual, like you said, this is how to do a commit. He actually shows you how to use it with a lot of the UI tools, how to use it inside of things like VS Code and PyCharm as well, uh, in order to sort of uh, kind of a practical guide to how you would use it as a programmer. We'll include a link in the uh, show notes in case folks are interested. Yeah, awesome. Well, thanks again for bringing a whole bunch of PyCoders goodness this week. Always fun. I'll talk to you soon. Cheers. And don't forget, go to mailtrap.io to complete the email development cycle. Test and send your emails within one solution. I want to thank Christopher Trudeau for coming on the show this week. And I want to thank you for listening to the Real Python podcast. Make sure that you click that follow button in your podcast player. And if you see a subscribe button somewhere, remember that the Real Python podcast is free. If you like the show, please leave us a review. You can find show notes with links to all the topics we spoke about inside your podcast player or at realpython.com slash podcast. And while you're there, you can leave us a question or a topic idea. I've been your host, Christopher Bailey. I look forward to talking to you soon.